Chapter, Academic Passion Essays 1 Title, Bacon, Writer, Mariam Nasiri, Duke University The alarm clock is, to many high school students, a wailing monstrosity whose purpose is to torture all who are sleep-deprived. Those who believe this are misguided and are simply viewing the situation from a twisted perspective. For when these imprudent early risers blearily rub their eyes each morning and search in vain for whatever is making that ear-splitting noise, they are, without a doubt, annoyed. Why? It isn't because the only thing they desire is to sleep a few extra hours, as many would presume. No, these kids are groggy and irritable because they are waking up to what they think will be another horribly boring day of school. If one of these foolish Sallies or Joes were, say, sleeping comfortably on a Saturday morning, I could certainly see something different happening. A beautiful breakfast of tantalizing vittles, eggs, hash browns, and the like, would be ready and waiting for them on their kitchen tables. But the scrumptious delight to outshine them all would be a slab of bacon, piled proudly for the taking. It would be that wafting, wondrous bacon smell that would draw a dear, sweet Sally abruptly from her slumber, long before an alarm clock has the chance to pierce the air. Oh, bacon, what a marvelous, glorious thing! I live for those heart-stoppingly good strips of succulence, so crispy and crunchy, so packed with perfection. The thought of having a plate of bacon every day, perhaps every school day, sends me into sheer waves of ecstasy. To be sure, many others would also wax poetic about this lovely breakfast food. But precious few would share this same zeal for learning. I, however, can smugly decree that I do regard both very highly. I brightly waken every morning to the mellifluous joy that sounds from my alarm clock, a huge smile plastered on my face, and the yearning to learn in my heart. When I board my school bus Monday through Friday, it is still pitch black outside. Busmates will groan about how even the day has not yet dragged itself out of bed, I only chuckle through their 30-minute rant fest as we chug down the freeway. Opting to be part of a faraway magnet school, after all, has its benefits. My peers may still not look forward to waking up earlier, but when we are all together in a classroom, we take on the bacon mentality. I have the opportunity to choose from a wealth of diverse classes and love arriving to school each day with the prospect of having a new Spanish history lesson, taught to me in Spanish, for a change. Teachers, driven by the enthusiasm of their magnet students, are inspired to create new classes for advanced students, including those who have completed AP Spanish literature and are still eager to learn more or those who want to learn about a specific aspect of a subject, we now have a Middle Eastern history class. Not to be outdone, the post-AP exam period of my English language class included an intensive literature study where we laughed at good Ali Asarian in Catch-22 and developed a strong attachment to Jay Gatsby. I'd like to think that the great Gatsby's pursuit of Daisy is not unlike my own pursuit of bacon. I've gobbled up new knowledge rapidly, hankering after it like any elusive bacon strip and happily digesting any new bits of information. But six classes a year are simply not enough to satisfy my hunger for knowledge. Just as I eat bacon all three meals of the day, when possible, I attempt to learn all days of the week. Rather than make another trip to some lackluster movie theater on the weekend, I dedicate my time to reading another good book or reviewing economics with my friends. But high school is starting to smell like leftovers to me now. I want fresh, new, crisp learning. I want not to read a textbook written by a renowned professor, I want to hear him speak directly. I'm ready for the university and hunger for all the new opportunities waiting for me. I finished my breakfast and now it's time to get going to school. Analysis of Essays 1 Merriam's essay Bacon uses lively language and plenty of humor to tell a story that highlights her eagerness to go to school. Her writing is casual and funny, and it conveys in a personal and genuine way her enthusiastic attitude. Bacon reminds us that topics do not have to be serious to be sincere. The metaphor of bacon is a very memorable one in image, smell, texture, and taste. Merriam capitalizes on these features in her beautiful and mouthwatering descriptors of a Saturday morning breakfast of eggs. With a touch of humor and a hint of parody, she writes, Oh, bacon, what a marvelous, glorious thing. I live for those heart-stoppingly good strips of succulence, so crispy and crunchy, so packed with perfection. The thought of having a plate of bacon every day, perhaps every school day, sends me into sheer waves of ecstasy. 
Just when the celebration of bacon begins to appear over the top and readers are beginning to worry that Miriam swapped a food magazine piece with her college admissions essay, she links the succulent bacon metaphor with school, to be sure, many others would also wax poetic about this lovely breakfast food. But precious few would share this same zeal for learning. Though Miriam takes a risk in waxing poetic over bacon, she does so with carefully calculated dramatic effect that ultimately pays off. We are convinced that the yearning to learn is deeply ingrained in our bacon lover and early riser author. Miriam's narrative also shows us the sacrifices she makes for attending a magnet school far from home. Her use of the phrase bacon mentality is original and creative. Miriam's descriptions of her classes are specific enough to prevent them from reading like a list. Rather, she demonstrates the depth of her commitment in her classes by citing specific details like Eusarian in Catch-22. Miriam's essay demonstrates how she is able to fit impressive details of her life into a narrative framework, a strategy that can avoid the pitfall of sounding like bragging. Miriam follows the show, Don't Tell Mantra when she mentions the magnet school in the context of her long early morning bus ride and in celebrating her Spanish history class, which is impressively taught in Spanish. At the end of the essay, the bacon metaphor may seem overdone to some readers, as Miriam has gobbled up new knowledge rapidly, hankering after it like any elusive bacon strip, and has expressed a desire for fresh, new crisp learning to satisfy her hunger for knowledge. She might have reduced the number of mentions of bacon and hunger. However, Miriam's essay ultimately stands out for its originality and unpredictable connections, like linking the great Gatsby to, what else, bacon. Chapter, Academic Passion Essays 2 Title, Beyond Plug and Chug Math Writer, Anonymous, MIT I have always been a math science girl. I sight and sulk through classes on U.S. history and French in eager anticipation of the formulas and applications I would be learning later in the day. I believe there are many factors which attribute to my success, two being my fascination and persistence. When I was seven, I once asked what math was good for and why I should learn it. The answer I received simply does not do math justice. One day when you're in line at the grocery store the cashier will give you too little change and you'll be glad you learned this. Now in calculus I see the application of all these once foreign symbols, formulas, and letters. I am often amazed by the calculations I am able to do using the cumulative information acquired from nearly 12 years of education, such as how to maximize the volume of a box, given a certain surface area. Math is not just plug and chug as many views it, but it requires creativity and thinking out of the box to solve the problems encountered in the real world. Beauty lies in its simplicity and in the fact that proofs and observations are what brought the golden rectangle from ancient Greece, Pascal's triangle, and the Pythagorean theorem as well as a host of other theorems, equations, and postulates. Math has made the impossible possible and the once long and tedious, simple and quick. The genius of it is amazing as well as the fact that any person is capable of applying and discovering it. I draw graphs and try to make shapes from functions for fun, count to 10 to calm down, and save money at the store too. For all of these reasons and many more, I am fascinated by math. I wasn't always good at math, contrary to what students in my classes might say. When I first showed interest in math in the fifth grade my parents laughed, middle school was even worse. Incoming sixth graders were given a test on the second day of school and depending on their scores, were placed into a higher low-speed math class. I was put in the slow-speed math and missed a lot of class my first year, as a result my grade drifted from a B to a C to a C then I got help. I knew I liked math and I didn't want to do bad in it, so I bought books and hired my older brother to help me. I eventually made it to a B+. Later, in the summer after my junior year, I took a course that covered nearly a year of calculus. I was told that if I decided to take calculus ab, I would be bored, so I went for a challenge. My strongest subject began to take up most of my time. I had to read review books, go online for help, and stay in during nutrition and lunch for extra instruction. It was hard, but my dedication paid off, and I earned an A. This persistence and drive also helped me excel in math. Analysis of Essays 2 In this essay, the author begins by stating that she has always been a math science girl. The honest confession that follows, I cite and sulk through classes on U.S. history and French, underscores this point. She goes on to provide specific examples of her fascination and persistence regarding math, even causing a chuckle 
when she asks why math is useful to learn and receives an answer that doesn't do math justice, being able to count change at the grocery store. This is comical, providing an excellent contrast to algebra with its foreign symbols, formulas and letters. The rendering of math as a foreign language shows us the fascination the author has with math and its applications. Her praise of math and vision for the potential of what to others might merely be a boring academic subject is memorable in its admiring tone, she notes the creativity and thinking out of the box math requires and believes its beauty lies in its simplicity. The references to specific math theorems, equations, and postulates further strengthen the author's assertion that she is intrigued by all the applications that math has for the real world, whether they are ordinary or academic. The strength of this author's examples lies in their accessibility to a general audience. She summarizes this nicely when she writes, I draw graphs and try to make shapes from functions for fun, count to tend to calm down, and save money at the store too. The reference to saving money at the store nicely ties back to the original anecdote about math being undervalued in society. The second half of the essay addresses the author's persistence in math, following a most persuasive first section that clearly convinces us regarding her fascination for this area of study. I wasn't always good at math, contrary to what students in my classes might say, she writes. This first sentence of the second paragraph comes as a surprise, since we are accustomed to associating passion for a subject with skill in the field. This section shows that writing about a weakness and not meeting expectations can still make an effective essay topic. Though most people would not admit to getting a C in class, this author does so in an honest way, in order to show the amount of progress she has been able to make. While the improvement in her grades is impressive, this anecdotal information might have been even more interesting had she spent more time explaining the ups and downs of achieving higher grades and taking a summer calculus course. Still, details the essay mentions, such as staying in for lunch to get extra instruction, certainly attest to her dedication. Overall, this essay provides a full and balanced explanation of the author's passion for math as well as her arduous journey toward excellence. Chapter, Academic Passion Essays 3 Title, A Different Kind of Love Writer, Ona Emilia Butnarinu, Stanford University When I was four years old, I fell in love. It was not a transient love one that stayed by my side during the good times and vanished during the bad but rather a love so deep that few would understand. It was not the love for a person but the love for a language. It was the love for Spanish. Having been born and raised behind the Iron Curtain, in a country where Western influence was limited and the official and only language was Romanian, I was on my own. Everyone around me, especially my family, had trouble understanding what could possibly draw me to such a foreign and, in their opinion, unattractive language. But as they say, love is blind, and the truth of the matter is that I wasn't even sure what it was exactly that made Spanish so fascinating to me. The only thing I knew was that I absolutely adored hearing its perfectly articulated phrases and trying to make sense of its sweet and tender words, serenades to my innocent ear. Spanish entered through my door on June 16, 1994, when a man from the local cable company came to connect our living room to the rest of the world. That day, I was introduced to ACASA, a Romanian cable network dedicated to broadcasting Spanish-language telenovelas, soap operas, to Romanian audiences. As I learned to read, I started associating the Romanian subtitles with the Spanish dialogue, and little by little, I began understanding the language. For a little girl who had yet to discover new aspects of her own language, this was quite an accomplishment, but no one around me felt the same way. My father, enraged at my apparent obsession with the language, scolded me incessantly, declaring that, we are immigrating to the United States, not to Mexico. You should spend your time learning English instead of watching that nonsense. Sadly, my family's objection was only the first of many hardships I was bound to encounter. When I was nine, my immigration to the U.S. forced me to say goodbye to what had become a huge and indispensable part of me. I needed to hear Spanish, to listen to it daily, and although Los Angeles could be considered a Spanish speaker's paradise, my largely Romanian neighborhood allowed for little interaction with the language. For six years, destiny kept us apart and the feelings that Spanish had evoked in me soon faded away. But high school brought about a new era in my life, an era in which my love for Spanish was revived and greatly amplified. For an hour a day, life was put on hold, and I was able to speak and read Spanish more actively than ever. After two years of advanced placement Spanish, I not only understood the language to perfection, 
but spoke it flawlessly as well. There are no words that can describe how proud and greatly accomplished I feel today at my ability to speak Spanish. During a recent trip to Mexico, I was mistaken more than once for one of the natives. One man, after seeing my Romanian last name, asked me if it was my husband's, for undoubtedly, he believed, I was Mexican. Given to a Romanian girl, whose family members were oblivious to the language and who had learned it on her own despite their objections, this was the greatest compliment of all. In the United States, Spanish is the second most spoken language and a great asset for anyone who speaks it. It is not nonsense, as my father had dubbed it, and being able to prove this to him has made me even prouder for loving Spanish. My love of Spanish has influenced much of who I am today. The fight that I led against family objections and immigration to a new land has allowed me to develop an ambitious and aggressive spirit in the face of adversity. It has made me stronger and taught me that I must always fight with unstoppable perseverance for all that is important to me. I am determined to use my love and passion for Spanish to make an impact on the world. Currently, Spanish is the primary language of 21 nations around the globe and one of the six official languages of the UN. I want to be the link that connects these nations to the United States and to the 40 million Americans whose native language is Spanish. I want to use my ability to speak Spanish to learn more about the people of these nations, both on a professional and personal level. No matter where the path of life takes me, I wish for Spanish to always be a part of me. Through the years, Spanish has evolved into one of my most remarkable accomplishments. Today, I am prouder than ever of loving Spanish of having something that distinguishes me from the rest, something that makes me unique. It is not often the case for a Romanian-American girl living in Los Angeles to exhibit such passion and devotion towards a language that is foreign to both her native and adoptive countries. Nevertheless, Spanish is a big part of whom I am today and an even bigger part of who I will be in the future. Analysis of Essays 3 Bona's essay opens with a fresh perspective on a theme that is often overused and can easily become hackneyed love. The first sentence surprises us. When I was four years old, I fell in love. Her young age piques our curiosity, and she holds our suspense until the last sentence. Like many of the excellent essays in this book, the strength of this essay lies in its originality. Ona describes a love for the language of Spanish. Learning Spanish in itself may not seem particularly exceptional, but Ona's background as a Romanian provides an unusual and memorable juxtaposition to her Spanish-speaking abilities. In her descriptions, Ona playfully and effectively uses terms relating to love. For example, she notes that love is blind and personifies Spanish as it entered through her door on June 16, 1994. The sentence, for six years, destiny kept us apart continues to perpetuate a personified sense of Spanish, the language, being a lover to Ona. These examples show the power of artfully expanding on a metaphor to provide richness and coherence to one's essays. Ona's love for Spanish's sweet serenades contrasts with her family's feelings towards this foreign and unattractive language. She uses her father's comment to capture these negative sentiments with powerful dramatic effect. We are immigrating to the United States, not to Mexico. You should spend your time learning English instead of watching that nonsense. His criticisms only make Ona's accomplishments all the more admirable and memorable, how many other Romanian girls teach themselves Spanish through watching telenovelas, while their family looks on disapprovingly. Ona writes frankly of the hardships she encountered, first in the form of family resistance to learning Spanish, and later in the form of lacking an environment for communicating in Spanish in her predominantly Romanian Los Angeles neighborhood. However, she demonstrates her dedication to Spanish during the new era of high school, when she studied actively for two years and astonishingly became fluent in the language. Ona relates several amusing anecdotes from her trip to Mexico to corroborate her fluency in Spanish. We learn that she was mistaken more than once for one of the natives. She might have chosen to tell us more from this trip in order to show ways in which she was able to prove to her father that Spanish was not nonsense. In her penultimate paragraph, Ona relates her long process of learning Spanish to her ambitious and aggressive spirit in the face of adversity as well as to her further plans to use her love and passion for Spanish to make an impact on the world. Ona could have ended her essay with this paragraph, since her final paragraph mostly reiterates what she has already said. While it can be tempting to use concluding paragraphs to recap what you have already written, it is best to end in a way that seems fresh rather than regurgitating what has already been said. Chapter, Academic Passion Essays 4 
Title, From Flaubert to Frisbee. Writer, Aditya Kumar. Brown University. This summer, I went to the Governor's Honors Program, also known as GHP, a six-week intensive college-like experience where the best and brightest students in Georgia gather to learn and grow as individuals. It was the best thing that has ever happened to me. That is something of a hackneyed phrase, people cheapen the extremes of language by constantly using superlatives for everyday occurrences, making it harder and harder to actually describe the few subtle and transcendent moments of life. In Madame Bovary, Flaubert claims that language is but a cracked kettle on which we play music for the bears to dance, while we dream of making the stars weep. The experiences we have never fit within the too close confines of language, but I will try anyway. The classes that I attended were nothing like the classes that I would take normally. Nowhere else would the teachers encourage 16 and 17 year olds to look for sexual imagery in Shakespeare and then find even more than they did without the exercise being sorted instead of literary. I attended classes named anything from dirty words, clean thoughts, a class on profanity, the only course in which the use of profane or vulgar language was prohibited, to teenage female angst, beyond Holden Caulfield to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. All of them opened my mind to a brand new way of looking at the world and processing information. Thanks to the varying education that I received, I know that valuable information about life is not only in the classics but even appears in seemingly mindless and trashy zombie films. While I learned a lot in the classrooms of GHP, I feel that most of my growth occurred outside of the classroom. I met the sort of people who will change the world, who will go forth into the world and, without making a big name, will do the things that make the world a better place. My best friends there were people that I would never have met, people I would never have known existed, people that I can now not imagine life without. One was a math major, an excellent athlete in every sport, and an accomplished singer, the running joke was that the only thing that he was bad at was failing. The other was a phenomenal writer, always ready to play an endearing trick on somebody and the former's girlfriend. Both of them were fairly conservative Christians and yet totally accepting of me for whom I was, despite any of my clashes with their beliefs. I did not limit myself though and made it almost a mission to find and talk to as many of the people there because I was sure that each and every one of them would have an interesting perspective on things. Once I was walking back from playing frisbee and was stopped to discuss what the ethical framework for life ought to be, just for fun. The experience that I had there has undeniably changed me forever. Analysis of Essays 4 Aditya's description of his six weeks at GHP make use of plenty of diverse and lively examples to demonstrate how this was the best thing that ever happened to him. The one-paragraph format that Aditya chooses can be difficult on the readers since long paragraphs can be quite daunting. Aditya might have chosen to create a new paragraph with the sentence, the experiences we have never fit within the too close confines of language, but I will try anyway. Another logical place to begin a new paragraph would be with the sentence, while I learned a lot in the classrooms of GHP, I feel that most of my growth occurred outside of the classroom. In general, multiple paragraphs help organize an essay to focus the content and provide flow to overall paper structure. While the sentence, it was the best thing that has ever happened to me seems simplistic, Aditya quickly redeems himself from the cliché with a sentence that shows his mastery of the English language. He writes, that is something of a hackneyed phrase, people cheapen the extremes of language by constantly using superlatives for everyday occurrences, making it harder and harder to actually describe the few subtle and transcendent moments of life. His reference to Madame Bovary demonstrates Aditya's ability to draw connections between ideas and thereby support his own assertions. The examples Aditya references are particularly strong because he relates them to one another instead of simply rattling off a long list. It can be challenging to present a diversity of interests while also holding a core focus. Aditya's center appears in the form of literary and cultural analysis of many sources, from classics to trashy zombie films. The reference to Madame Bovary also shows us that Aditya truly learned to open his mind to a brand new way of looking at the world and processing information. Had Aditya ended his essay here, we would have learned about his cognitive development but missed out on the social and emotional aspects of his GHP experience. The descriptions of the close friendships Aditya formed with a diverse group of people further strengthen our understanding of how Aditya grew to be an open-minded person. Aditya devotes quite a large amount of space to talking about the math major who couldn't fail and his writer girlfriend, he might have summarized this information more concisely in order to explain his own relationships to them. 
By writing that they totally accepted him, Aditya removes his personal agency. He could have reworded the essay to explain how he became more accepting of them. The last sentence of the essay, the experience that I had there has undeniably changed me forever, is somewhat abrupt. With limited space, it is important to have both a strong introduction and a strong conclusion that are not so open-ended that they could be generalized to everyone. The most compelling part of Aditya's essay is not that the experience that I had there has undeniably changed me forever, but rather in the sophisticated literary analyses he made, the friendships he formed, and the frisbee he played. When space is limited, err on the side of more detailed descriptions and fewer generalizations. Chapter, Academic Passion Essays 5 Title, Raising the Bar writer, anonymous. MIT. This past summer I had the opportunity to participate in a highly rigorous academic program at MIT called MITES, Minority Introduction to Engineering and Science. For six and a half weeks I lived with 68 other rising seniors and college undergrads. Though we were all warned about how hard the program would be, we were all at the top of our classes and refused to believe it after all, who did they think we were? The first day we sat together in a small auditorium, unaware of each other and of what lay ahead. We were told that our confidence would be shattered, our minds blown away, and our lives changed forever. Still somewhat unmoved, we were not afraid. By the second week of Mites Valedictorians, nerds, bookworms, and techies alike were leaning on each other's shoulders at two in the morning crying over problem sets they had imagined only in nightmares. It is a well-known fact that hard times bring friends closer together, but I would have never expected for these strangers to become my best friends, my support system, or even my family. The 16 hours days I was accustomed to at home did not last long. I was getting an average of four hours of sleep per night, finishing a book per week, zooming through subjects once foreign to me, and constructing a semi-autonomous robot from drill motors all at the same time. We were each enrolled in five classes, my schedule consisted of introductory physics, engineering design, chemistry, first-year calculus, and humanities. In the month and a half we completed a semester of physics and chemistry each, a full year of calculus, the material equivalent to a semester in AP literature, and introductory level engineering. The work was so intense that when I entered school in the fall I enrolled in second-year calculus and maintained the only A in AP physics, having no physics experience prior to MITES. Since this program I have not been satisfied with the regular coursework given at my school. I am constantly on the lookout for new programs to enroll in and other teams, clubs, and groups to join. This academic school year marks the peak of my involvement in educational opportunities. I have somehow managed to find time for the speech and debate team, ACE mentoring team, swim team, science bowl team, California Honors Society and Scholarship Federation, play production, Jewish Student Union, Gear Up Mentoring Program, and Folklorico Dancing. Mites was the most challenging experience of my life. The program is the single most pivotal point in my academic endeavors to date. The assistants we had had all gone through the program and agreed that even in college at Harvard, MIT, Caltech, and Princeton, nothing came close. The motivation and encouragement I gained from Mites has fueled my academic pursuits and pushed me to raise the bar. Analysis of Essays 5 Many students choose to write about a transforming summer education experience. In Raising the Bar, the author describes the grueling, rigorous academic program at MIT in which he participated. Foreshadowing the difficulties that lay ahead, the author writes, we were told that our confidence would be shattered, our minds blown away, and our lives changed forever. Still somewhat unmoved, we were not afraid. This fearless attitude gives way to crying over problem sets. The essay aptly describes the intensity of the program by explaining how busy the days were. She found herself finishing a book per week, zooming through subjects once foreign to her, and constructing a semi-autonomous robot from drill motors all at the same time. While these tasks might seem like a list, they are necessary to account for the author sleeping only four hours a night. When describing an event with a scope that is quite broad, in this case, six weeks long, it is always helpful to hone in on a few highlights. Three is typically a good number of examples. This essay might be stronger had the author explained more about the robot construction, since this is an unusual activity that piques the reader's curiosity. As a major project, the robot may have merited more space in the essay. 
The author could have spent less time listing the classes she took, especially if she could list this elsewhere in the application. What is more compelling than any course title is her observation that the work was so intense that when she entered school in the fall, she enrolled in second-year calculus and maintained the only A in AP physics, having no physics experience prior to MITES. This demonstrates the extent to which her learning was accelerated because of the MITES experience. At the end of the third paragraph, the author gives a long list of activities in which she is involved. It is unclear what some of the activities entail, for instance, the ACE mentoring team or the gear-up mentoring program. These examples might be more appropriate in a resume or another section of the admissions essay. Choosing one main activity or event and elaborating on it is a strategy to help keep an essay focused. While it is tempting to list all of our accomplishments, it is more memorable to focus on just one or a few. Ultimately, the author brings us back to her main point that Mites was a pivotal point in her academic career. Having a main thesis helps tie together an essay. In this paper, the author summarizes by saying, the motivation and encouragement I gained from Mites has fueled my academic pursuits and pushed me to raise the bar. When editing your own writing, ask yourself if your various examples, sentences, and paragraphs serve the main point. This helps create a coherent, tightly woven essay. Thank you. Part 2 will come soon.